So starting with this, we have already discussed well-known trademark and there we have uh, got it what is well-known trademark, why it has been recognized. So as you know, well-known trademarks are a kind of exception which has been recognized for protecting the well-known brands because uh, they have that very, I mean, uh, reputation all around the world and they made that very effort. So to, to incentivize that very effort, we recognize well-known trademark, number one. Number two, because there are chances that people may get advantage, I mean, the competitors may get advantage of the mark, which is a well-known trademark. Because of that also, uh, well-known trademark have been recognized. Now we are dealing with trademark dilution and comparative advertising in India. So what is that? So dilution, you just go by the etymology or you can say the generic term, what does it mean? So what does dilution mean? Dilution means lessening or minimizing or in any way narrowing down some sort of reputation or some sort of, you can say, the image of a particular mark that would be considered as dilution. So trademark dilution means whatever reputation has been created, whatever goodwill has been created, that has been distorted or you can say minimized or adversely affected by someone who is using some other mark, which have some identical, you can say similarity or visible similarity to the previous well-known trademark. So the whole concept of trademark dilution was dealt before under the passing of vaccine because we don't have that kind of specific prowess which now we have. Now we have uh, under 29 clause 4, we have incorporated the provisions relating to the trademark dilution. That is why that is recognized as well as that has been taken care of. And you can see the significant changes which were there when this was not included in our trademark law. So having said that, there are two terms which I have used, trademark dilution and comparative advertising. Both have to do something with some mark, which, which is a popular one, which is a very famous one. And the other one is making some sort of impact by its use. So in cases of comparative advertising, the competing mark, suppose there is one mark, the other mark, uh, trademark which is uh, used in competition, is being used in a way where it is just you know describing something which is just an improvement over the previous product that is fair enough but if it is being done in a way where it impairs the image of the previous mark then that comparative advertising is to be is considered to be objectionable so these are the trends which we are just you know uh, prevailing in the domain of trademark so let us start with trademark dilution So as per our syllabus, uh, there are two segments which we have to take into account. One is trademark dilution and contemporary areas where we will discuss the case of ITC Limited versus Philip Morris products. And under the next head, protection of trade dress and color combinations, tarnishment of trademarks, comparative advertising, disparagement, here we will discuss a number of cases which are being elaborated uh, just below. So uh, first to start with the uh, trademark dilution. So we have to look into the history of it. Why it has been you know, projected, why it has been introduced, what was the need. So as you know, there are big players in trade, there are small players in trade. So there are some tendencies in trade domain which are responsible for the trademark dilution provisions. So first of all, that there was a changing trend in business and there was a wave of globalization which allows the various companies, which were the giant companies, 
to carry their business or to introduce their business in different countries. So because of that, they need some protection in various countries. So this was one of the reasons why the provision relating to trademark dilution is required. Number two, expanding trademark protection beyond its traditional limits. So this was another, I mean, uh, a kind of tendency among those trademark holders that they were pushing that their marks would not only be protected under their boundary, but beyond that. And this is also because they seek to have a monopoly advantage. Then there was an obvious reflection of the ever increasing demand for extending more and more protection to famous trade. So as I said that there were some, I mean, uh, prevailing forces in the form of big companies, which were just, you know, pushing this very regime to recognize the demand for famous protection of famous trademarks. And again, the doctrine of territoriality, as I have discussed in the case of well-known trademark, it has been, you know, diluted because of international global trade. So famous marks reputation now transcends beyond the territorial limit and it extends to even unrelated fields of activity. So what is the definition of trademark digestion that we will be coming up, but it must be very clear in your mind that whenever we talk about trademark dilution, some sort of famous mark or you can say when your mark is always concerned. Because the dilution which we are concerned with is related to the famous marks. So TM dilution theory seeks to extend maximum protection to this potential capacity. So the whole full idea is to preserve the uniqueness and singularity of the trademark, which is very important trademark or very long trademark. So now the question comes, how this dilution occurs, how it could be given effect. So there are three modes through which trademark dilution could occur. The first one is through tarnishing, or you can say, uh, impairing the image that is tarnishing, then blurring, creating kind of confusion, or you can say making it less distinct, that is termed as blurring, and free writing. Free writing, I have already explained to you in our, my previous discussions that if uh, because of certain positive externalities, because that is not being a mark is not protected significantly, some other competitor may take benefit of it. That is termed as free writing. Without, I mean to say, you are doing something without repaying or paying that uh, advantage to that very mark which you are using. So that is termed as free writing. So now what is the definition of trademark dilution? Trademark dilution refers to acts that weaken the uniqueness of a famous trademark, typically as a result of blurring or tarnishment of famous mark. So these two are very common. The other free writing was not that much common. So unlike trademark infringement, trademark dilution involves use of a mark in connection with goods or services that do not compete with those connected to the famous mark. So here you have to clearly understand this thing that in case general cases of, or you can say normal cases of infringement, there is no, there is always a requirement that the goods and services must be identical or similar. But when we talk about trademark dilution, the case becomes very different because here the, the, the requirement is that the goods or services that do not compete with those connected to the famous mark. So it must be very clear, this is a different exceptional case for infringement, which is being described under section 29 clause four. So for a mark to be considered famous, what is the requirement? It must have achieved extensive public recognition. So again, it is a question of fact, you have to examine it, and then you can find out whether it is a it has substantial public recognition in substantial segment of the public or not. So it is generally means that the mark is instantly recognizable. So very apparent proof must be there, which 
is a kind of requirement in the case of famous marks or well-known marks. So if you find, if you uh, try to explain it with examples, you will find brands like Coca-Cola, Sony, Nike, these are the various names which are very much pervasive to the household as well as to the whole global community. So they are being considered very, very famous because everybody is recognizing it and there is no requirement of any other proof. Now coming to these processes through which the trademark dilution could be made or could occur. So first we will take up blurring. What is blurring? When a third party uses an identical or virtually identical mark or on or in connection with goods or services that may be completely different and unrelated to the plaintiff's goods or services. So two things you have to uh, realize that first thing is that the third party is using that identical or virtually identical mark in connection with those goods or services that are totally or completely different and unrelated to the plaintiff's goods or services. Dilution by blurring, what is the impact of it? By seeing the impact, you can make the distinction between blurring and tar tarnishment. So what is the distinction between these two? You will find that dilution is always addressing the distinctiveness. So, sorry, uh, by blurring is always uh, making an impact where distinctiveness is being impaired or you can say it may be affected. So dilution by blurring weakens the distinctiveness of a famous mark. Hypothetical example of dilution by blurring may be taken as Polaroid mark if it is used for shoes. Rolls-Royce mark if it is being used for toothpaste. So you will see that Polarad or Rolls-Royce, these are two different kind of items. And the items which are used in connection with that very mark are totally different. One is Sue, the other one like Rolls-Royce is a car and then you are talking about toothpaste. So if you're using it for the toothpaste, the condition is fulfilled that you are not using it for the similar good or competing mark. But a very, very different kind of good or service. So blurring will take on the effect when it weakens the distinctiveness of a famous mark, that is blurring. So what is tarnishment? In the case of tarnishment, when a third party uses a famous mark in an inappropriate or unflattering way, so how that could be inappropriate, how that could be unflattering. So for example, you can say that you, uh, such use would include using an identical or similar mark in association with sexual or offensive content. So that may impair the image of that very mark which is previously established. That is the famous mark or well-known mark. So you are here tarnishing the image of that very company by having these kind of elements uh, this kind of mark in association with that kind of element. So that is critical of the mark's owner's beliefs or subject matter that directly criticizes or attacks the mark owner or its products or services. So here if you are making any attempt to impair the image of that very company, which is a famous brand or famous mark or well-known mark, then that very activity could be termed as tarnishment. So these are two very popular methods, blurring and tarnishment, through which trademark dilution could be done. So many a times, this kind of trademark dilution conflict with the free speech rights. Because everybody is free to, I mean, uh, make a mark or try to have a very innovative mark. Mark. So if this very tarnishment criteria is not considered cautiously or applied cautiously, that may conflict with their free speech rights because they are free to express, they are free to select. And as such would be considered fair use of a trademark. So fair use of a famous trademark may include use of the mark in parodies or criticism of the products or services associated with the mark. So this is a kind of, uh, you can say, uh, risk which is always attached with the trademark dilution theory 
that if you are not cautiously applying it, it may conflict directly with the free speech rights. Third very mode through which trademark dilution could be done is free riding. So free riding I have already explained. So here again you can see free riding occurs when a mark owner receives the benefit of a positive association between that mark and a well-known mark. So in cases of well-known mark, as I have already mentioned, you always go for what sort of connection is there. So if you find out that the connection is making a kind of, you can say, correlation between the previous mark and the other mark, then the case of well-known trademark could be established. Likewise, that connection is also being ex I mean, examined in the case of trademark dilution. If that connection is established, then the further criteria of trademark dilution could be applied. But if that connection doesn't exist, then you cannot move with the trademark dilution requirements, which are the additional requirements. So free riding occurs when a mark owner receives the benefit of a positive association between that mark and the well-known mark. So sometimes what happens if you are uh, taking a mark of, uh, or you are taking a very similar or identical mark to a very well-known brand, you may get certain benefits. And sometimes it is not even making, or you can say causing any as such injury to the previous mark. So you are taking benefit, but the mark is not that much affected. So that is why it is not that much a very strong, you can say, mode of trademark dilution. So as I, uh, I, I, I mentioned in the uh, second point, free riding cannot be considered as an injury or damage in trademark law as the defendant's gain need not always result in plaintiff's loss. So that's, that case is not always be there. So because of that, free riding is a little, you can say, weaker mode of trademark dilution. Coming to dilution theory, so it is based in that injury to trademark even in circumstances when there is no confusion and even the marks involved are non-competing. These two things are very much prevalent in the cases, normal cases of infringement that you go for the deceptive similarity where you can see that the competitor's mark or you can say the other person's mark is very much confusing and it is, uh, I mean, uh, in that way, causing some harm to the other one. And when we talk about normal cases of infringement, we are always concerned with the competing goods rather than non-competing goods. But in case of dilution, there is no confusion which uh, exists in that very competitive, you can say, or competing marks. And they are, as regards to good, are not competing. As regards to good, they are not competing. It means to say they are being used with regard to different goods and services. So mark itself becomes a product by guarantee the quality of it. And sometimes the informative advertisement could take shape of persuasive advertisement that in a way that it may be objectionable. So informative advertisement is all good, but the persuasive advertisement, if it is being done with some ulterior motive, or you can say to take advantage of someone or something like that, then that may not be considered as a very fair practice. So the whole idea of trademark dilution, as I told you, that came from the well-known trademark holders. Because of that, it is being criticized that there is a lot of confusion with regard to this very theory and countries are not that much you can say uniform in protecting it so as a famous uh, you know uh, law scholar uh, professor mark limley has rightly pointed out that what is the ultimate object of trademark so he has pointed it out that the tra trademark law was never been inclined or focus to maximize profits of trademark owners at the expense of competitors and consumers. So if you define trademark and its purposes, you will find that it is nicely balanced. That on the one hand, 
It protects the interest of trademark holder by allowing him to establish his goodwill, by allowing him to, I mean, exclusivity with regard to his trademark. On the other hand, it enables the consumers that they may not be misled or something. But to maximize the profit of only one trademark holder, because trademark also promotes fair competition. So if it is inclined more towards a particular trademark, then it may be alleged that that very balance may be gone, that it is being done on the cost of various competitors. So this is a point of criticism, which is usually attached with trademark dilution. Coming to the next one. So here there are various issues which could be raised with regard to trademark dilution. First of all, what essentially matters most? Is that quality which matters or is that brand? So there is a very significant or interesting study which shows that in cases of famous brand, sometimes people get or consumers even get that much fascinated with the brand rather than the quality that those manufacturers or trademark holders, they try to focus more and more their brand building rather than the quality. So this is one of the case in the cases of famous uh, marks or well-known marks. Next point is whether the idea of trademark dilution, it's stretched too far. It means to say whether it has been applied in a very, very widely manner or you can say in wider context. So there is no certainty as regards to that very scope. So because of that, there is always a kind of ambiguity that what is the real scope of extending the trademark dilution to a certain extent. Third one is well-known and famous marks. There are two distinctions and there is always a kind of difficulty in defining both. So as a point of distinction, Famous marks are a little higher in degree as compared to well-known marks. A well-known mark may have certain criteria which could be fulfilled and if it would be adjusted factually, it could be recognized by the court or by the trademark office that it is a well-known trademark. But whether that very well-known trademark is a famous one, that is very, very subjective because in, to be a famous mark, that requires to a very, very large parameter, you can say a large coverage uh, in various countries or in a uh, large population. And then and then only it could be considered as famous. Mark. So, so there is some, some, some sort of distinction between well-known and famous marks. And there are some countries which use famous marks more rather than well-known. So this kind of uncertainty is always there in terms of definitional conundrum. Then coming to the <clears throat> general rule. So trademarks are protected only in relation to same or similar goods or services covered by their registration or use. Competing as well as non-competing goods are included in the case of trademark dilution. So there are some contentions that how there could be unfair competition in the case of non-competing goods, because that is more visible in the case of competing goods, that there may be some sort of, you can say, uh, uh, you can say uh, kind of dilution or something, or a kind of impairment or something. So this is another area where uh, the questions are being asked that how there could be unfair competition in the case of non-competing goods, which practically doesn't appear so. Next one is, <clears throat> in cases of dilution, by blurring, it is or tarnishing, it is always speculative and difficult to prove. So speculations are always being considered very, very susceptible of doing something which is not that much fair, or you can say not that much uh, uh, from T2. So because of that, uh, this is also being criticized that dilution by blurring or tarnishing 
which is based always on the speculative cons uh, considerations and it is very very difficult to prove in the court of law that is why it is being a kind of very you can say uncertain criteria most trademarks are not sufficiently well known even then people approach to the office and they ask that you must declare it for the well known trademark so if there is a laxity in recognizing the various trademarks which are being coming to the trademark office then again the well known status could be given to those marks which are not even that much sufficiently well known so again there is a kind of risk attached with the trademark dilution then insistence by almost every trademark owner of some repute as i said that they emphasize that yes my mark is well known given this very fact or something like that so if the caution is not being taken then that very trademark is not properly given the well known trademark status another criticism is made against this doctrine is that the purpose it intends to serve is not supported by trademark theory which i have already mentioned that trademark theory is based on promoting fair competition in trade and promoting competition among various trademark holders so here if uh, the approach is to protect more and more a single entity which is a well known trademark or a famous trademark by this very theory of dilution then it will not be conforming the general theory of trademark so it has been recognized under uh, trips law as well as indian law and relevant terms are which are which is uh, i mean uh, existing in this very case is in indian conditions as you know it is the the term which is being used as knowledge or reputation among relevant sector of the public which is being considered as a benchmark for considering this very criteria so what is the position here in india as relate Uh, uh, regards to trademark dilution so as i told you section 29 clause 4 in the trademark act deals with trademark dilution so how it deals what are the conditions how it has been described so we must go through it so it describes as a registered trademark is infringed by a person who not being a registered proprietor or a person using by way of permitted use uses in the course of trade a mark so it what does it mean it means to say a registered trademark is infringed by an unauthorized person so if he uses some mark which is identical with or similar to the registered trademark number 1 num and it is is used in relation to goods or services which are not similar to those for which the trademark is registered and lastly the registered trademark has a reputation in india and the use of the mark without due cause takes unfair advantage of or is detrimental to the distinctive character or repute of the registered trademark so you have to clearly understand that what are the various criteria which needs to be present in the case of trademark dilution so first thing is that there must be an unauthorized use of that very trademark and how that use could be done and what kind of similarity could be there so here it is clearly written that a person using by way of permitted use so uses in course of trade a mark which is either identical or similar to the registered trademark so there is no deceptive similarity nothing that kind of condition which has been imposed here if the two terms which are being used is that mark may either be identical or similar to the registered trademark number 1 number 2 it is used in relation to goods or services which are not similar to those for which the trademark is registered so here again this is a peculiar condition which must exist then and then only we can invoke section 29 clause 4 that the mark which is in question must be used in relation to goods or services which are not similar to those 
of the trademark which is registered. And third thing is very important. Third criteria is very important because you have to not only establish these two things that are identical or similar or used in relation to goods or services which are not similar for those, but also the registered trademark has a reputation in India and use of the mark without due cause takes unfair advantage of or detrimental to the distinctive character or repute of the registered trademark. So every, all these criteria are well connected, first, second and third. And all these must be present, otherwise you cannot prove the dilution of the trademark. So here you must processly go through 29 clause 4 where these conditions are clearly mentioned that which I have just mentioned. So what are the issues? So unlike other provisions dealing with infringement, there is no requirement of confusion in this section. As I told you that there is no case of deceptive similarity or something like that. Second one is the extent of reputation is not defined. So that is a kind of difficulty. You have to have some criteria of def defining what is the reputation. And in India, as you know, there are some criteria which uh, factors which could be taken into account in ascertaining the reputation. And then there is no need to satisfy the requirement of confusion. So this is this doesn't matter. It is not material that you must establish a kind of confusion if all these three criteria which I have mentioned about they are fulfilled. So in this very case, it is pretty different from the normal case of infringement. So because the, I'm approaching to uh, the time, uh, so we will discuss the case relate, relating to it. So there are two cases which we have to go through and uh, I will be just discussing within, within two minutes and then we will be leaving it for the further discussion. Sorry. So one concept we have already gone through. The next concept is comparative advertising. First of all, we must understand both here and then we will proceed through case laws. So what is comparative advertising? It is being dealt under section 29 clause 8. So a registered trademark is infringed by any advertising of that trademark. If such advertising, number one, takes unfair advantage of and not of. So you must uh, be clear that the conjunction is there. So takes unfair advantage of and it's contrary to honest practices in industrial or commercial matters. So unfair advantage, contrary to honest practice, both must be there. Second one is it is detrimental to its distinctive character or is against the reputation of the trademark. So the other two criteria are like that. So section 29 clause 9 says, where the distinctive element of a registered trademark consists of or include words, the trademark may be infringed by the spoken use of those words as well as by their visual representation and reference. In this section to the use of a mark shall be construed accordingly. So that is a kind of ex example where you are using the, uh, you can say words. So there are two concerns which have been raised regarding to this very definition of comparative advertising. What, was, what were those? Number one is, it is suspected that these provisions might be used to curb freedom of expression. Because again, if you are advertising something and you must be given that freedom that you can describe your mark as you wish. So if there is a strong or stringent, you can say regulation of that very process, then you cannot express yourself or your mark in a better manner. So it has been always, uh, you know, alleged that these provisions might be used to curb freedom of expression. And number two is with regard to two subsections, section B and section C, it has been said that in order to prevent dishonest practices in trade, the first one is enough, sufficient. We didn't require or doesn't require the second and third one. So in order to prevent dishonest practices in trade, people believe or scholars believe that clause B and C should not be included. So 
this is all about today's lecture so i am just you know stopping it here and uh, we will be meeting in the next lecture with the further discussion thank you very much